Welcome back to the Real News Network and Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay, and joining us again in the studio is Professor Leo Panitz. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Hi, Paul. One more time, Leo is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at York University in Toronto. He's the co-editor of the annual Socialist Register. He's also co-author of the UK Deutsche Book Prize winner, The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire. So let's pick up our conversation. If you didn't watch part one, I, I suggest you do. This will make more sense. Um, so you're born in 1945. Uh, I know I grew up full of the, imp uh, I'm born in 1951, so I mean, uh, you even more than me are in the immediate shadow of World War II. Uh, I remember when I'm four or five years old singing songs out on the street, uh, whistle while you work, Hitler was a jerk. Mussolini bit his peony, now it doesn't squirt. Every show on television was mostly World War I dramas, I mean, World War II dramas. The, the, what happened in the war was just all around me and I assume even more you. Um, you grew up in an anti-fascist family um, and then you're about four or five years old and McCarthyism hits the United States and while some Canadians like to believe it didn't hit Canada, to a lesser extent, but certainly to an extent it did. How did that affect uh, your family, the, the, the political atmosphere you grew up in? Less than you would think. Um, I certainly remember being told by my mother and father that my Aunt Rose, who had been a member of the Communist Party, had burnt a signed copy of the history of the Soviet Union, Bolshevik, uh, signed by Tim Buck, the leader of the Canadian Communist Party, had literally burnt it because she was afraid that her husband, who was a butcher, would not be uh, allowed to have his pension uh, if the book was found in their house, as likely as it would be found in this you know, second floor tenement apartment that they lived in. But certainly uh, there so were Canadians got, fired from jobs as they were in the yes, United States. Yes, but you States, can see yeah. how it would affect a working class yeah. person. Most people who were fired uh, were people who were working as journalists, as teachers. Uh, they were the people who were more affected. Much years. less affected, of course, in Canada, but affected, uh, certainly. Um, yes, I mean, it, uh, one was a, I, I wasn't aware of it all that much. Uh, I, you know, was in fact most gobstruck by it when I was a student activist. I was treasurer of the University of Manitoba Student Union, and led a strike, a march, on the parliament buildings, on the uh, legislature uh, in Winnipeg against the raising of tuition fees. Uh, and when I got back to uh, a family event, it was my in-law's house, my brother's family, uh, his wife's family, uh, I was greeted by someone at that event who had seen me on television leading that march, and he called me a communist. How old are you? I was probably 19. Uh, and I was taken aback and shocked by this, uh, and hurt by it, I have to say. Uh, uh, because I grew up in a milieu, quite rightly, in which uh, I was not sympathetic uh, to the Soviet Union. Um, you know, I became a socialist and a Marxist against the example of the Soviet Union. I think that happened to most people of my generation who got radicalized in that period. So to be called that would have been, you know, not that I was a traitor in that sense, but that I was in some sense undemocratic. Whereas I would have thought leading a march in favor of lower tuition fees, uh, that I was representing democracy and student influence above all. So, you know, it had those kind of reverberations in which people would use it uh, in, in a way that probably didn't have the same effect as it would be used on someone who was a communist. Now, now there's a difference between people who grew up in the milieu of, of critiquing, being opposed to what was developing in the Soviet Union, and the attitude towards Marx. What was, the, is there any sense of Marx in the family well, as you, you grew know, up? I, I, sure, I mean, of course, when you wouldn't would hear in my household uh, something about Marx, you more likely would hear something about someone who would be accused of being a Marxist, like your namesake, Paul, Paul Robeson, who was, of course, a hero in my household. 
uh, even more so in my Aunt Rose's, because he was identified as a communist, she was a communist, therefore she'd really identify him. But people like Paul Robeson, someone who was a black radical as well as a leftist standing up to McCarthyism, these people were heroes. Uh, and he came to Winnipeg, indeed, appeared at the Labor Temple, uh, I remember, this is going to sound odd, when I was invited to speak at the Labor Temple at a benefit for a left-wing magazine some 15 years ago, going into a toilet stall and thinking to myself, I'm probably sharing this with the spirit of Paul Robeson. Um, so uh, uh, it wasn't so much Marx as people who, you know, would themselves be accused of being Marxist, perhaps. Uh, I'd never thought of myself as a Marxist. Uh, it, you know, one didn't growing up in a working class home in that sense. People who didn't define themselves that way. I remember it was only in second university that I whispered to a friend who I ended up writing that last book you just mentioned with, uh, Sam Gindin. I just had read the preface of the Critique of Political Economy, which I now think is pretty crude. But I remember reading that and whispering to Sam, I think I'm a Marxist. Uh, and I think one knew that that was a bit of a frisson. It was, you know, you were going past where the left is safely goes uh, within a good company or establishment company. Um, I, I want to say, though, that the, the Winnipeg I grew up in, differently from others, I think, of my generation, who were middle class or upper middle class, the children of lawyers or doctors or businessmen. I grew up in working class Winnipeg, uh, not upwardly mobile. So my memories of the 1950s were much more about my dad being laid off every winter, uh, my mother going to work as a night cleaner in the bank when my father got laid off, a lot of the left, a lot of socialist feminists in the 1970s developed this notion as a bad notion of the family wage. My mother was the strongest proponent of the family wage because when my dad wasn't getting a pay increase or was laid off and unemployed, she had to go out and be a night cleaner in a bank. Right? So she, I would hear the word scab in a strike more often from my mother than I would from my father. Um, I remember my father pulling me onto his lap when I was already, I think, in grade nine. Came home at four o'clock and there he was at the kitchen table. Uh, and uh, he pulled me on his lap and started crying. And I realized what had happened. He had either lost his job or been laid off that day. If he was in a bad mood, I got the sense it was because he'd been told off by some foreman. Uh, and that he was someone who was much more educated, not in a formal sense, uh, than this bastard who had told him off. There was a certain resentment in the household that I could tell when we would go to the odd time to a synagogue and, you know, my father would point to some rich businessman who could barely spell his name, uh, but who was sitting next to the rabbi because he had contributed so much to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, community, quote unquote. Uh, so there was a sense of class. It was a sense of class that split the Jewish community. And, uh, you know, I think that's important to bring out when you talk of my Jewish roots, my Jewish background. Was what was particularly important to me, I think, was this awareness. During the post-war period, the great heyday of the welfare state, etc., of how precarious life was even for a trade unionized working class person, right? People think that precarity is something that is recent, that didn't exist back in the 1950s. What did change was that, and although it, it, it in some ways continued, was that the fraternal organizations that, uh, as they were known, uh, that the various ethnic groups created for themselves before the welfare state, they would put pennies each week into a fund that would guarantee that if they had to go to a doctor, if one of them died, there would be a fund they could call on which would pay that fee if necessary or pay for their funeral so they wouldn't be buried in a pauper's grave. My father was very active. His greatest activity was in something called the Winnipeg AIDS Society, 
Uh, he learned the Roberts Rules of Order of running a meeting. I think more there than in his union meetings. And I often thought to myself, not least because he was self-educated, voraciously read the newspapers, was interested in politics, but also because he knew how to run a meeting, that he knew more about politics than my undergraduate political science students when I started teaching them. Right. Uh, and I was aware that that was something significant for a working class person. Talking about the development of the welfare state in Canada, um, in your youth, you go to a Tommy Douglas rally. Your father was involved in the CCF, and Tommy Douglas had a lot to do with developing the, what Bernie Sanders goes on and on about the Canadian health care. Uh, what, uh, what was that moment like for you, the, the enthusiasm about Tommy Douglas, and also how do you assess that now? Uh, the first socialist government in North America was the CCF, the Canadian, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation government elected in 1944 in Saskatchewan. One of the great political scientists of the United States, Seymour Martin Lipset, writes his first book on that phenomenon. Uh, when you become a political scientist, that's one of the key books you read in the post-war era. What produced this party, this third party, how did it happen, etc. Um, yeah, and Tommy Douglas was a hero in my household, more than any Zionist you could name, more than Theodore Herzl, or in terms of our earlier conversation about my dad being a social democrat and a labor Zionist. Uh, Tommy Douglas was a hero in but our the, home. The, the and, Bernie and, Sanders of his day. Yeah, and but, he was certainly, but, he was more than the Bernie Sanders of his day, much more than the Bernie Sanders of his day, because he was actually premier of Saskatchewan, about uh, introduced the first hospital care program, uh, and is seen by all Canadians now as the father of Canadian Medicare, of our socialized health system. Uh, so there was this rally in Winnipeg, I remember it very clearly, in 1957, I was 12 years old, it was the, during the election of 57, my dad took me, it was probably my first big political meeting, uh, and after it was over, my dad got up and walked towards the stage, and as he did, my, my father looked up and Tommy Douglas looked down, and Tommy Douglas said, hello, Max. And my father, this working class person who went off to work in this dank factory every day, became a hero in my eyes. Uh, that Tommy Douglas, of course, he was a great politician. And he knew activists in the party, <laughs> you know, had been around for, by that point, 20, 25 years in the party. He knew many of them by name. It was not such a big deal. But to me, you know, my father became a superhero that, that day. So I had a somewhat similar moment. My parents took me to a Tommy Douglas rally at Maple Leaf Gardens. I must have been about seven, six, seven years old or something. But one of the events burnt into my memory. Um, it's a little bit of a segue, but I think it's worth it. Um, a lot of Americans with this debate about health care cannot understand how the heck did Canada ever have such a system? Why didn't the private insurance companies and such have the same kind of power? Uh, how, do, how does this come to be that you get such a development in a, you know, right, right, right across the border? Well, uh, it had to do, of course, with the development of uh, a mass social democratic party. Uh, it had to do with that party becoming government of one of the provinces uh, and starting the ball rolling. Uh, in the late 1940s, but then seeing it through in the face of a doctor's strike uh, in the in early Saskatchewan. 1960s, yeah. right? Um, it had to do with the fact that such a party looked upon the achievements of the British Labour government above all the establishment of the National Health Service as uh, something that they were very able to use in Canadian political discourse to their favor. And since, of course, the Anglo tradition in Canadian political life, because we were, after all, the dominion of Canada, uh, a colony of Britain before we became a colony of the United States, an informal colony of the United States, uh, there, you know, there would have been a certain influence even on conservatives. Uh, by virtue of the British Conservatives not undoing the National Health Service once it was established in Britain in the late 1940s. Moreover, there was a conjuncture between 19, late 1950s and the mid-1960s when the dominant Liberals were being challenged and displaced very briefly by the Conservatives 
and had minority governments in order to secure themselves back as the dominant party in Canada, the Liberals always moved slightly to the left. And insofar as they were minority governments, they needed su the support of the Social Democratic Party. By that point, it was called the New Democratic Party. So there was those kinds of reasons going on. Now, the main thing is that it happened at that moment. It happened by the 60s. If it hadn't happened then, you're absolutely right that the insurance companies would have made given what happened with privatized medicine, uh, with the extent to which they were accumulating profits out of people's most basic needs for health, it would have made it much more difficult to get it later. So the fact that it didn't happen in the United States at the heyday of the New Deal, right? Uh, insofar as it didn't happen uh, under Kennedy and Johnson, although some moves were made in that direction, uh, then it was much diff more difficult to take on all of those capitalist interests in that industry later, right? We've just been doing a series on The Real News called Undoing the New Deal. And one of the points was that uh, in 19, just on the eve of war, uh, Henry Wallace, who became Roosevelt's vice president, and others in the administration, and Roosevelt was going to go along with it, were going to introduce uh, a government health insurance plan. Yeah. And then, in order to rally the party, including all the forces against the health care reform for the war, Roosevelt gave up on it. Yeah. And, you know, one wonders what would have happened if Roosevelt had not died when he did, uh, if Truman, who was, never would have been uh, president of the United States, except for the fact that he was a useful choice for vice president at the moment he to was get chosen. Rid, to get rid of Wallace. To get rid of Wallace, exactly. Yeah. Uh, things might have been different. But again, you know, capital in the United States was much more powerful uh, than it was in Canada, as a, obviously, uh, as a political force. So, you are excited, inspired by Tommy Douglas. At the age of 19, you're leading a protest, though I have to add, uh, just to embarrass you, you are at Eaton's department store junior executive. That was what in the high heck? school. What the, yeah, what the <laughs> heck's that story? About? Every high school. Uh, this, is a uh, big, this is a big department chain at the time. I think it's, it's like Macy's. Business now. Like yeah, Macy's. It's like Macy's. Yeah. Uh, every high school in, in Manitoba, perhaps, but certainly in Winnipeg, uh, were given uh, the opportunity to appoint two high school students as the Eaton's junior executive. Now, what that essentially meant was that you got a blazer, a blue blazer with a logo, and the right to work Friday nights and Saturdays and during the summer. So it guaranteed you a job. Uh, I used to sell underwear to farmers, <laughs> long underwear, combinations we used to call them, uh, to Canadian farmers who would otherwise freeze uh, in the winter. Um, and, and yes, I was an Eaton's junior executive. And after I Is became known as had a... the little thing on the back, you could undo the... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, vents, they were called. Uh, much later when I became a well-known Marxist intellectual in Canada, someone uh, anonymously sent me a photocopy of a page from the St. John's High School yearbook. Uh, which had a photograph of me and a photograph of a woman called Janet Zukowski, who later became a Canadian ambassador. Uh, we were the junior executives that year, and there were photos of us uh, in that yearbook as the Eaton's junior executives. So the irony was, was uh, uh, obvious. So not long after this 19-year-old leads this pro protest, you, had, you do university your first round of university, first four years as well. My first uh, undergraduate degree was in economics and political science uh, at uh, the University of Winnipeg. Uh, I studied with uh, a man who founded the Canadian Dimension magazine, which next to Monthly Review is the oldest independent socialist magazine in North America now. That's Saigonic. Uh, he had Saigonic is his name. He had just come back from Berkeley. Uh, where he had been involved in the free speech movement, the radical activities at Berkeley in the early 1960s. What year were you? Uh, that was uh, 19... I studied with him in 63, 64, 65. He had come back in probably 62. Uh, some of my professors were Marxists. Uh, and and 
that had some influence already. Certainly, they, many of them were radicals. Uh, and so, and you know, a lot of people were engaged in the anti-Vietnam struggles uh, in Winnipeg in the mid 1960s. So, it was, I only went off to London in 1967. Uh, as a Commonwealth scholar. I'm not sure I thought of myself as uh, anything more than a left social democrat or a radical in that period, although I had whispered, I think I'm a Marxist. Uh, certainly, I don't think Saigonic thought of me as the most radical of his students. Um, what, I what it, what, even at the time, and to some extent looking back, what's the difference in your mind? What does it mean to say, I'm whispering I'm a Marxist, yeah, versus a what a left social democrat. I mean, what's very, the difference? It's a very good point. And I don't think I understood that then. Um, uh, I think it was only uh, in light of the social democratic parties uh, failure to go beyond the reforms they had secured in welfare benefits and health care. Uh, by the 60s and 70s, that one began to be aware that they, those reforms were increasingly running up against their limits within a continuing capitalist dynamic. That they were going to be constrained and maybe even undone unless you went beyond them to actually take the decisions about what's invested, where it's invested, what it's invested for. Uh, meaning, away from capital. Meaning who has power? Meaning the democratization of the economy. Um, and I th don't think there was a, enough of an awareness until the 60s, and my generation became very aware of it, of course, of how bureaucratic social democratic governments were, how they had been brought into the structures of the state in a way that didn't democratize the state. Uh, that as the man I discovered at uh, the London School of Economics by chance, whose intellectual influence did change my life, Ralph Miliband put it in his famous book, Parliamentary Socialism. The first line of it reads, uh, of parties which take socialism as their goal, the Labour Party is the most dogmatic. Not in the sense of socialism, but in the sense of its commitment to parliamentarism. And, and it was generally true that the social de democratic parties uh, became enveloped in the institutional structures of parliamentarism, electoralism, but above all, the bureaucratic structures of the departments that they were ministers of. And one got a sense of that in the 60s. That's really, I think, what the new left was about. It was both a reaction against the Soviet bureaucratism uh, and also a reaction against the reformist bureaucratism, whether it was the New Deal bureaucratism in the United States or the social democratic uh, uh, in, in Europe, to some extent in Canada. You know, women on welfare were most frightened of their welfare social workers, of the income maintenance workers. They were the people who'd show up in their houses and see there, whether there was an extra toothbrush uh, uh, in the glass, uh, in which case they'd be thrown off welfare on the grounds that they happened to have a boyfriend, you know, uh, despite the fact they were single mothers. So that was part of what was going on, I think, at that time, which led us against and beyond uh, both Leninism and social democracy. Okay, in the next segment of the interview, we're going to pick up uh, Leo heads off to England to go to university, as he just mentioned. That had a lot to do with transforming the way he looked at the world. So please join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.